I just got done with my first quarter at UCSD yesterday and last night I was like I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna read because I haven't done that like for pleasure in a while and I before the semester started I picked up the book um, It Ends With Us by Colleen Hoover which everybody hates and I was like I'm gonna pick this up I'm gonna see why everybody hates it it can't be that bad so is this like, like a romance novel? Is this like a fiction yeah. historic? Okay, okay. Yeah, it's a romance novel. Colleen Hoover's known for like her plethora of romance novels that she writes. So we're, I'm like a hun- like 60 pages in at the time where I just like put it down and I was like, this is really hard to get into. I don't know if this is the book for me. So I pick it back up last night and I like get through 200 pages last night and I'm like, damn, this book really fucking sucks. And <laughs> It's because she builds up these characters and, you know, they're developing and you're falling in love with them. And you're like, dang, this book is good. And you're just like, mm, mm, mm. And then out of nowhere, this guy just like starts hitting on his fucking girlfriend, like just smacking her. And I was like, okay, I get it now. Fuck Colleen Hoover. We protest Colleen Hoover. Because she's literally romanticizing domestic violence and relationships. When what you should be romanticizing is 300-year-old vampires flirting with teenage girls. I thought you were about to get yourself canceled. I was like, oh, God. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) yeah. yeah. You should romanticize that. It's very hot. You know, there were a couple books I read when I was younger (laughs) that had unsatisfying endings. And I got to say, Margaret Atwood is an author who's, like, notorious for this. Like, she wrote this really interesting book called Oryx and Crake about this guy who grows up and his best friend is this like genius biologist and his best friend kind of goes crazy after like creating a bunch of crossbreed species and releases a plague that like destroys the entire world and this guy is like a much older man reflecting back in this post-apocalyptic society about the events that led to this um And the entire book is like building to the discovery that there's other people still alive in this post-apocalyptic society. Um, But it literally ends with him just staring at his watch, being like, what time is it? What time is it? What time is it, Sandman? Because he calls himself Sandman or something. And then it just ends without him connecting with like these other humans. And I guess like it could be a reflection upon loneliness, but it really feels like she had this really interesting idea to build a world from and then wasn't certain how to turn it into like a satisfactory ending. I I I have the same problem with a couple authors, but like that's a really good example. I don't know. My favorite is Go ahead. I already forgot his name. Uh, My favorite is um, Neil Stevenson, who is this like really incredible science fiction writer who creates these like really incredible, like realistic worlds about, you know, near future possibilities with these really compelling, like fleshed out characters. And then after spending like 600 pages building up like this elaborate fiction and elaborate world, it's like he gets bored and decides that the next 50 pages, he's going to wrap everything up. And so you're like, oh my god, this could go on for like 15 volumes, all that you've created, this elaborate lore, these elaborate character arcs, you know, all this cool stuff going on. And instead he's like, nope, gotta get to my next book. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I I feel for romantic novels, maybe it works a little bit better, just because it's like, well, once someone's orgasm, they're gonna lose interest in this, so we'll wrap it up. Domestic abuse. Call it a day. God. Joel, stop saying things that could get us cancelled. I mean, we got we to gotta encourage controversy, Naomi. I mean, look how, how Steve Harvey has done, being like, women, get in the kitchen and wear some lingerie for your man. That's what you need to keep your relationship together. Welcome okay. back Let's do to this. Why Will No One Date Steve Harvey. That's untrue. Plenty of people are willing to date Steve Harvey. Why Will No One Date These Guys? I'm Joel Guy. I'm Naomi Guy, and I'm drinking a lot of liquids today. So if you hear some weird things, it's probably my plethora of liquids that I have. I have the trifecta of liquids right now. I have coffee, I have water, and I have saltines. Mm -mm. I'm going to disagree with your assessment about the third one, but uh, I'm Joel Guy, and I am drinking a liquid today. It is Poppy Ginger Lime Soda. Um, I have successfully identified the brand this time. I'm not just calling it Ginger Lime like I was last time. Um, It is overpriced soda that apparently is good for your gut health. Um, Not good for my wallet, I tell you what. Okay, did Lauren just, like, go crazy with Poppy? Like, is this her new obsession? Cause no, I know this she, is like, me. Maybe, like, I, oh, this is you. Okay. Fry's had it slightly on sale, and I was like, we need something different. It was a different add to the aisle. 
Okay. Well, go off, King. I don't like it. It's like kombucha, but like way too acidic for kombucha, not enough sweetness. It's, um, I'm confused. Like, is this technically a soda, the one that you picked up? Because I know that the last one that you drank was a soda, but. It is sparkling water, cane sugar, apple cider vinegar, lime juice. No, but like, is organic it called agave. a soda? That's a good question. It is called prebiotic soda. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I guess that's uh, literally just kombucha, though, is prebiotics or probiotic soda. Yeah, it's it's kind of like a vinegar shrub, which you can get at, you know, fancy bars, but it doesn't taste as good. Um, Did you hear about and... this new trend that's coming out that's like non-alcoholic bars? It's just juice oh, hell bars. Yeah. I'm all for that. I want the no, tastiness too... of alcohol without the harsh burn of alcohol. No, I'm I'm totally for it too, but it's like, what's the appeal to the general population? Like, I feel like alcohol, I guess alcohol is kind of moving its way out. I've been hearing that a lot, is people are just moving their way people can do some incredible things with fruit juice and sparkling water naomi it's it's really cool you know how the there's this new cocktail movement which is just like what if you could go and enjoy a girl drink without being unable to drive home right it's like what if you can go have a nice night on the town without having to worry about you know uber or lyft or getting a ride with your friend becky who abandons you in the wrong part of town and you have to fight off a series of werewolves and a harrowing adventure I'm working on. Um, I don't know where we're going Becky. with this. Naomi, can we get back to Steve Harvey? Wait, I have one more thing. Have you heard about yeah. the, the the Christian clubs that are opening next year? Is this just an episode where we're like, <laughs> so, you versed in this controversy? No, but seriously, have you heard about them? I was going to bring it up because this this new mocktail thing is is coming. But have you heard about the Christian clubs that like are opening, but they're just going to be playing Christian you, like rap music? Do you mean do you mean church, Naomi? Are, are you no, familiar with I the concept of mean church? They are <laughs> nightclubs where you can get a drink and you can dance to Christian music. It's so interesting how like. And, and this isn't unique to Christianity, but like often Christians will have, you know, a lot of um, harsh reactions to certain aspects of culture and be like, this is gross and weird and subversive. And like a really good example was Elvis and how Elvis was seen as this like pervert who was, you know, corrupting the youth. But then there's a bunch of like elderly church ladies who still really enjoy Elvis music now because he's become so sanitized over time as like society has moved on. And in the same way, I think, you know, 20 years ago, the concept of a Christian club would be completely insane. It's like, I don't want my children going and mingling with, you know, the indecent men about town. But now it's like, no, Jesus loves clubs, don't you know? You know, Jesus actually started the Catholic Church in a club, you know? We, 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 well, we, we're going to get together. Oh, do you think they have, like, really good acoustics so you can do, like, choral music in the clubs? No, oh, no, it's, so like, hot. meant to be, like, Christian, like, like house music. So, like... It, it's similar to the music that you hear at a club, but it's it's Christian themed. It's Jesus themed. The reason why I bring it up is because Steve Harvey and Think Like a Lady, Act Like a Man. They act like a lady, think <laughs> like a man. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> is, he, he brings up the fact he's like, you shouldn't like meet a girl at a club. You don't meet your wife at a club. Why are you spending time at a club? But now I'm like, okay, this literally goes against everything that he's saying because he wants more like Christian women. There you go. No, is, no, no. What is Steve, his take on this? Steve's Harvey's problem was that he knows people like clubs and he knows that he's not making any money, but now he's opening up clubs and he's like, I can monetize this with the non-alcoholic mocktails and the, 14 year olds being married to 26 year old men or whatever people are into these days that's not christians that's lds well that's flds and it's still shockingly legal in a lot of states naomi and yeah. uh i don't think it's any one religion practicing it but um you know what religion practices uh, is perverts okay we're done <laughs> <laughs> it's close to uh, which time. religion is that naomi oh please be, be more specific um naomi steve harvey think like a lady act like a man whatever you said uh that's not the book we're discussing today (laughs) we're discussing straight talk no chaser a book that i really thought we'd wrap up sooner but when i was putting together this outline i'm like oh you're right there's actually a huge amount of shit in this that needs to be discussed your outlines are like 60 pages per one page of actual text so i'm not surprised yeah it's called being a contributing member of a podcast naomi Calling me out like that. God damn. 
Uh, do you remember any of the things that we've discussed in the last three episodes? Any of the advice he's given? Any of the problems we've had? Oh, God. It's been so long. It's probably been, like, so long since we... I remember, like, the whole thing where he was like, my sons have to wake up when I get up. And, like, he, I remember the car advice where his mom was like, you can't get a new car until you, like, make room for your new car and get rid and of your old car. And Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, it's been a mixed bag. Last episode we actually were like, This is not horrendous advice, and don't worry, we're reversing, we're we're pulling the car in reverse and accelerating backwards in this episode, because he has a, a lot of interesting things to say in this one. Um, but yeah, it's been a mixed bag where he's like, I'm gonna redeem my legacy, and his legacy is like horribly misogynistic advice, and the advice he gives to try to redeem his legacy either directly contradicts what he said in the previous book or reinforces it in a worse way. Um, so I'm not sure if he even wrote this if you know maybe a ghostwriter wrote this to capitalize on the fact that like steve harvey's first book was super successful and they assumed future ones would be super successful too but um it's really bad advice please do not give this book to other people um it's not the worst thing we've read but by no means is it like an acceptable code of conduct for people to follow with that naomi we're going to get in chapter six and in chapter six is titled let's stop the games Asking men the right questions to get the right answers. Simple as we men claim to be, we can be tricky creatures, especially when it comes to women. We are the masters of the okie dokie. What? I don't know if he spelled and, it right. Oh, no. Yeah, that's weird. I don't know. And we will dole out affection in jerks and drops and use them as emotional placeholders until we decide in our own minds whether we really want to be with you or where we want to move on to the next conquest. We'll send the sweet text messages to get you swooning and then go for days without calling. We'll spend the day, the whole of a month whining and dining you and making you feel like there's some amazing chemistry between us. So this seems like bad advice um, based upon what he's already said. Like there are ways to thread the needle and balance the idea that men's are both super simple to understand and also incredibly devious. But I think the easier answer is that his desire to boil men down to incredibly basic terms is just wrong. Clearly men have a lot going on if they're able to do all of this stuff and build successful long-term strategies and plans. Does it feel like he's maybe making them out to be a little simpler than they actually are? No, I think that he's just basically saying, women, you need to be aware that men will lead you on and act like they want a girlfriend even after the six weeks and say, oh, yeah, um, actually, I don't want a girlfriend. And um, I was just leading you on for the last six weeks. And even though I told you that I loved you really early on, um, I was just love bombing you so that you'd love me back. So I have a sense of purpose for a little bit. Yeah, but I guess that to my point which is like men cannot be these completely oblivious guys who like live on easy boy loungers lazy boy loungers not easy boys uh easy boys is a another script i'm working on um but uh, sleeping on their lazy boy lounges watching you know espn eating cold cuts out of the package you know swallowing them whole like a duck um that that seems like such a gross oversimplification because clearly steve harvey also accepts that there's a lot of men who are like i'm gonna have to get really like maniacal in order to get the sex and the relationships i want um there's men who have these like elaborate schemes and trickery in order to convince women that they're actually falling in love with them when really they're just using them for sex and then are gonna you know throw them away later so i'm not saying these are necessarily the same people but it really feels that steve is like contorting men to fit whatever stereotype most conveniently fits his argument it doesn't really feel like it's accurate to say that Steve is representing men the same in all parts of this book. Sometimes men are super simple. Sometimes men are like incredibly stubborn. Sometimes men are incredibly scheming and treacherous. And he's kind of lumping them all into one category rather than accepting that, A, maybe men are different, which is crazy. Maybe it's really bad advice to say that all men are really simple. Um, but, but also, you know, gives men an out. So, you know, women can't accuse them of being devious and scheming. They're just like, no, I'm just a simple guy following my simple guy instincts. Read the next part. Let me know what you think after. So much can be found out about a guy before you get in too deep. If you take the time to ask the right questions, learning how to probe his answers will help you get to the very essence of who this man is and whether he has what you're looking for in a long lasting relationship. To do this successfully, though, you'll have to wrap your head around and understand one basic thing about us men. 
No matter the question, we will always give you the answer that will make us look the best, plain and simple. Aren't you tired of being the victim? Tired of getting played? Tired of thinking you got somebody and then finding out that he's not all he made himself out to be? Stop giving up the cookie. I hate that he says that. <laughs> I hate that he refers to the vagina as the fucking cookie. Oh, he'll have another metaphor. Don't you worry. That's coming soon. Stop giving up the cookie before you have all the information and instead get the information and then decide if it's in your best interest to share yourself with him. Doing this will take no t- more. Wait, take no more than three questions. I promise you it's hardly ever changes with us. Question number one. Will you get. We'll get you the answer that makes you look what makes us look best. Question number two, we'll get you the answer that we think you want to hear. And question number three, we'll introduce you to the truth. So, again, it's like kind of blurring the line. Men are devious and scheming, but if you just ask them three questions in a row, they're most likely going to give you like an accurate response. So men are like good at lying, but when pressed are going to crumble really easily. Again, not saying this can't be true, it just feels like a really badly thought out stereotype. That said, I don't think this is horrendous advice overall. Like, I do think that often when you're new to relationships, both men and women will stretch the truth and exaggerate in order to make themselves more appealing to partners. What do you think? Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think that that's definitely something that happens, and I don't know, like, I think it... I don't know why that occurs, honestly. It's like, okay, yeah, just be yourself. And if this person doesn't like you, then move on. Yeah. So he gives an example of how this manifests. So he says the the first question is the one that's going to get the answer that makes men look the best. So can you read that one? Question number one. Why did your last relationship break up? The answer that makes him look best is, well, I'm trying to be all I could be. I was working hard, trying to provide for her, and she didn't understand my work ethic, and she just didn't take it, and she just couldn't take it anymore. The breakdown being, this answer makes him seem like he's a hard worker, committed to building toward a future. It also plays into a woman's natural instinct to be nurturing. Makes you say to yourself, I would never leave a man who's trying his best. I'd focus on supporting him. So then he's like, you should ask questions two and three to make sure you're getting the whole truth. So question number two is the follow-up to question one that attempts to probe a bit more deeply. Question number two is, if if she were more supportive, would you have stayed in the relationship? The relationship, the answer that you want to hear is, absolutely, I want to be committed. I want to be with somebody who understands me and wants to be with me and understands what I'm about. I'm looking for that type of woman who wants to be committed and supportive to her man. The breakdown is he's telling you what you want to hear, that he's a man who's committed and looking for a long-term relationship and willing to do what is necessary to take care of you. He knows those are all buzzwords that get you hooked, and now he'll start He'll sit back and let you fill in all the blanks. Imagine him walking out of the house in the morning, briefcase in hand, going to work hard for you and the family, then coming home and holding and caressing you in his strong arms until you fall asleep. Of course, he doesn't say any of that other stuff. He just said what you wanted to hear. Don't fall for the okie dokie. Get to the bottom of it with this. Question number three. Well, if you were supportive, you were looking for loyalty, and you're a hard worker and a good provider, What could this? how could the relationship break up? What happened that she said, I can't do this anymore? The truth. Well, I was looking for that support because I couldn't find it at home. I met someone who was more supportive and loyal. The breakdown. The only thing left for him to do was to admit that it was infidelity rather than a non-supportive woman that led to his breakup. Of course, there are nuances to why he ended up cheating, but the fact is that the relationship ultimately ended because he was being unfaithful. He broke the cardinal rule. Now you know he's a hardworking guy who requires support and loyalty to be in a relationship, but you also know that he's capable of cheating if he feels like he's not getting what he needs out of the relationship. What do we think? I think that he just broke down three questions that he was asked on a date recently (laughs) because he cheated in his last relationship. Yeah, I I do find it kind of funny that he's like, well, if you ask any man three questions, he's going to eventually have to fess up to being a cheater. That's what men do. They cheat, don't you know? Um, Yeah, I mean, he gives some other examples, but like that's the one he opens with. And I found that to be a little amusing. But I think the core of this is smart, which is like, hey, it's difficult to keep a story straight. It's easy to give people what they want to hear. 
if you want to dig deeper and assess whether or not your partner like actually cares about you and you know whether or not they see this relationship as viable and any other number of things ask multiple questions don't settle for you know the basic um like genuinely this is solid advice that he probably should have thrown into the last book where it's like hey ladies i'm going to give you the tools you need in order to evaluate partners and find someone who cares about you um wow Steve, incredible. Now, the thing is, there are a lot of people who are really good liars. There's a lot of people who have practiced their stories and are good about reiterating what you want to hear and never admitting any fault. Narcissism is very common in dating circles. And so I don't think this is, as usual, enough to give you like the whole picture. Um, I think what you need to do is like ask these questions. Um, I think you might also want to ask friends and family of this person, less intense versions, like what were this guy's last girlfriends like, and then compare answers. um, If all of their stories wildly contradict uh, the person you're seeing might be hiding something. If they're all similar, there may be some truth there. Um, I do also think that constant dialogue is in a relationship is important as well. Uh, If you try to ask these questions and people don't want to engage with you or blow up, they probably don't see you as worthy of understanding like who they are or what they want, or they're, you know, hiding something. Um, Either way, like you should be able to date someone who's willing to be open about, you know, some of the problems they faced in past relationships. Uh, Steve also does provide, I think, which is some some good follow-up advice. Want to give him credit where credit is due because I'm going to kick his butt in the next couple of chapters. Uh, But he says, look, It's really awkward if you want to sit down and ask these people, you know, these questions one after another, right? If you were to like be interrogating someone on date number three with, you know, question after question after question, um, it's going to be unattractive. It's going to be awkward. It's not going to work out. So he says, spread it out over a period of time. Now, his suggestion is that period of time be 90 days. And why is it 90 days, Naomi? So that you don't give up your cookie too soon. Brilliant. Yeah. But I I think the same logic applies regardless of when you plan to have sex with someone. Like, if you ask them a question on the third date, you can then return to that topic maybe a couple weeks later. And then if you still are unsatisfied, ask it again a couple weeks after that and see how those answers compare over time. Because you will probably have picked up on other parts of their past over that. You may have additional details, additional context that may be relevant. And you can, you know, filter that in and, you know, naturally lead conversations to that with the additional information you've gleaned. Um, So not horrible advice, not the worst, but um, we're going to go in a completely different direction in the next chapter. So buckle up. Okay. I just have to say. Any other thoughts? Mm -hmm. I I did have a gymnastics teacher when I was younger named Miss Cookie, and it makes me rethink her as a person. That's a, uh, hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Don't, 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 don't like that. Don't like that at all. Okay. So Naomi, he's given you the important tools you need in order to. I will. I mean, he's giving you all the tools you need to be a successful single woman navigating the world of men. And here he's going to like double down on that and give you the real truth, the real advice that's going to prevent you from ending up lonely and single with just your cats to keep you company. And I'm going to do a slight changeover for chapter seven, and I'm going to read some of this and watch your audacity, audacious reaction in real time. (laughs) Chapter seven, presentation is everything. Don't let your off day be her on day. Nothing moves men more than your graceful curves, the softness of your skin, the shape of your eyes, and the pout of your lips, the way your calves look in a sexy heel, and the way you sway and glide across the room, everything on your body moving in a perfect, deliciously beautiful symphony. These things drive us crazy. It is absolutely the first thing we will notice about you every single time. We don't care about where you work. We don't give a damn about how much money you make. We don't care if you can actually string a whole sentence together, really. At least not when we're deciding if we're going to get your attention. When it comes to picking a partner to have children with, we tend to get a bit pickier. All a man is concerned about when he first sees a woman is how she looks, how she's dressed, and what she'll look on her arm when we're strolling along. To us... 
these considerations say the following things about you. Um, he says, it says, if you look good, it proves that you care about yourself, how you look in a man's eyes, and how you'll make a man look good when he's like interacting with people he knows or his family or coworkers or whatever. He then has a very interesting aside. Say you are the woman at the club in a dress that's a little too tight and the top that's a little too low cut, the makeup that's a little too loud, the hair that's a little too big and obviously fake, and the platform shoes that are a little too high. Oh, you might draw some serious attention dressed that way, but I can guarantee you that the men who approach you have some simple calculations in their heads. Two Long Island iced teas, three dances, plus a couple of half-planned zero-effort dates equals a hasty romp in the hay without any commitment from me. The woman will have a man, that woman will have men throwing her into the sports fish throwback category so quickly her bedazzled hair weave will spin. Remember what I said in Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man about the sports fish? She's the one who sends off the signal that she has absolutely no rules, requirements, or respect for herself, and that we men can treat her any old way with absolutely no effort to make our connection permanent or long-lasting. In fact, the only thing we'll see in that woman is a hint of desperation, extreme tackiness, and a flashing neon sign over her head that'll blink one night only. As in, once that night of fun is over, we don't have to be bothered with her ever again. The woman who dresses sloppy sends signals too. Men will assume that you, A, are incapable of fixing yourself up, that you don't know how to make yourself look hot, and quite possibly could have some hygiene issues, and B, you don't care how you look, and you could potentially embarrass him if he's going to introduce you to his boys or his family, and C, you keep a nasty house. None of these things are a turn-on. None of them, Naomi. Damn. It's true. When I see a woman wearing sweatpants, I'm like, oh my god, she has hygiene problems, don't you so, know? Do you know why they don't allow men to be coroners, and when they do, they have to go through, like, <laughs> a long process of, like, background checks and stuff? It's because men will literally fuck dead bodies. So Steve Harvey can kiss my fucking ass. <laughs> men will fuck anything that moves. Hygiene issues or not. Yeah, I mean... I guess what it boils down to is he's like women who look good have better success in the dating market. But the way he's framing it as if there's just like a bunch of desperate women dressing sluttily in order to pick up men and then a bunch of like really prim and proper women who, of course, are going to, you know, ride off on horseback into the sunset with their prince charming and i don't think that's how it works in real life i think regardless of how well you look regardless of how well you treat yourself you're still gonna get like uh for lack of better phrasing screwed over by a guy at some point the likelihood that a man's gonna treat you better just because you dress better seems pretty low to me knowing what i know about like dating abuse and assault statistics um so i don't know food for thought but it, it gets better naomi don't you worry So he continues, and he says, A woman who cares about herself and how she presents herself to the world and looks like she'd elevate her game is the woman who will get our attention. She's the one who will make a man down a shot, pat his boys on the back, and then take what feels like a 20-mile walk through a crowded club to ask you for a dance. Or work his way over to the vegetable section in the grocery store to strike up a a conversation about the difference between Roma and vine-ripened tomatoes. Um, I think Roma tomatoes can be vine-ripened as well. Is he saying the guy's stupid? You're getting getting caught Um, up. You're getting caught up. Just so he can talk with you. Before you get too bent out of shape at what I'm saying here, keep in mind that this philosophy was taught to me by my mother. Don't worry, guys. I'm not sexist. I've got lady friends, namely my mother, who dressed whenever she left the house. And she did this even though she was a married woman already. It was she who taught my sisters to fix their hair and put on something nice and apply a little makeup on their faces before they left the house, no matter what. Even if they were going to the store for a pack of gum, it was important for them to step into that store looking dignified. Conduct yourself with some dignity so that at least if you see a man, he can say to himself, wow, that's one dignified lady. At least he'll know up front he's dealing with a person who cares about herself. I don't know if any man like in the last 50 years has said that and not because like women don't look dignified. That just sounds like a 50s newsboy. Walk street, yeah. walk street, dignified lady walks into store, buy packs of gum, looks hot for all the fellas. I love when boomers like write books and they're like, I'm trying to be relatable. So I'm going to write this big word that nobody uses anymore down and act like everybody uses it all the time. 
stigma dignified. I'm gonna start using I black. Like how you couldn't even language. say that. Word. I couldn't even say it. <laughs> Nami, it's not a boomer. This is this is a boomer test. It's like reading cursive. <laughs> The way you dress, Naomi, is an extension of yourself. If you're seriously open into a relationship, why miss the opportunity of meeting someone because you didn't pull it together before you left the house? I'm telling you, a single woman who is serious about finding a man can't afford days where she totally lets it all go. In the event that Mr. Wright is somewhere in the vicinity, you have to be prepared to look the part of Mrs. Wright. And even if you're not looking the part, a man will not imagine you in the part either. Instead, he might just turn his attention to the woman who did bother to go to the grocery store with it a little more pulled together. Your off day may totally be her on day. And in that split second, when a man sees the two of you and is deciding which woman he's going to approach, I promise you the one who's on her game will get noticed first every single time. When you read me the title of this chapter, I thought it was going in a completely different direction. What did you think this was going to be about? I thought it was going to be like, don't let your wife go unsatisfied in the bedroom. Wink, wink. Oh, on fuck all no. Days He's never going to give that days. advice. <laughs> Naomi, I'm not joking. Steve Harvey's advice for how to satisfy your woman is to light some candles once in a while. Never is Steve Harvey like, ladies, you can ask for oral sex. It's like, ladies, you can ask him to use different words and light some candles and it's like steve do you know the dynamics of sex do you know what statistically will make women orgasm oh no. boy but yes he's he's a boomer and he didn't learn anything from women he's so proud of that his entire life the only thing he learned was from his mother and that was move your car out of the driveway and make sure the women in your life are dressed nice when they leave for the grocery store you know how we were talking about like how his kids needed to have like a certain like they needed to level up to his standards and yeah, yeah. one of the first parts of this book series that we're reading um do you think that he suggests to his daughters to look dignified when they leave the house every day? I would say yes. And here's my theory. Here's my theory about this book. I think if Steve did in fact contribute to this book, the advice he originally wanted to give was to call out women who have dating difficulties as being fat and unattractive. But then he realized, or his editor realized, that that's like, kind of rude and the people reading this might take offense to that and so they decided to settle on clothing instead because he's basically saying the same thing he's like if you can't date anybody it's probably because you look terrible you look like shit who wants to date dog doo doo they want to date the venus de milo and if you don't look like the venus de milo you're probably going to be stuck at that store crying because they're out of your favorite gum which you went to the store for because people live in walkable communities like they did when I was growing up in the 1950s. Um, again, I think that's a little bit of boomer coming through. But yeah, like yeah. It, it's it's advice that's just calling women who are having dating difficulties ugly. Now, yeah. the reason for that, he says, is you're not wearing enough makeup and clothing. But he could just as easily be saying anything else about like how they dress and how they look. I think he's also overestimating how much women actually want to be approached at random in public. Like, he's describing every single woman leaving the house desperate to find a man or have a man approach them. And I'm like, weren't you just talking in the last book about some of the best places to meet men? And they were, like, church or, like, clubs, like, like fancy clubs, not, like, low-class non-Christian clubs. And I'm like, how, why would a woman just randomly want to be approached by a guy that feels like that man has, like, ill intentions for her? Weren't you just warning women about like being randomly approached by men because they have like bad designs on them but instead he's like no you go to the grocery store you don't want normal cucumbers you want a man's cucumber book street book street i'm from the 50s i'm thinking about earlier this week when i was sick and if i was single i would have had to go out and like buy saltines and canada dry and stuff for myself and i'm just thinking like mm -hmm. how unapproachable I would feel also how I wouldn't want to be fucking approached if I felt like I was going to hurl at any given moment. Well, I'm just also confused because like bonds just one mm. of the most popular dating strategies. I'm not saying this was a good one. I'm just saying this is something that like men would do in the early 2000s was negging. Right. And it's still yeah. something that men do a certain extent, but it's like find a woman who obviously has something that's like 
off about her appearance that you can make fun of. And if you bully her and make her feel like shit, she's going to lower her standards to date you. Brilliant. Men, you've done it again. And I'm like, dude, men are going to approach unattractive women. Men are going to, you know, have conversations with women who, you know, have a runny nose or a head cold or something because they see them as easier targets. Sorry, that's how it works. This isn't good advice. And so it's difficult even for women to know, like, what's the level of attractiveness Steve expects me to be at? Because I'm sure no matter where women go, no matter how they're dressed, they're just constantly hit on to different degrees. But Naomi... I don't want you thinking that Steve Harvey is being rude to generic women out there in the world. He's actually being rude to people he works with. I was explaining this point to my employees just the other day when I noticed a few of them dragging into work, looking a little less than professional. I explained to them that even if they had a bad night or early morning, I shouldn't be able to tell it by the way they fix their hair or the outfit they chose. I'm not supposed to know that they're going through a rough patch based upon how they present at the office. I get that things may not be perfect at home. I understand that things happen and maybe you weren't feeling the business suit and heels and felt more like a jean and sandals state of mind, but that kind of attire has no business in a professional setting. We have an image to uphold. I don't care how tired I am. I'm going to dress and make sure I look good. I'm not coming out of my house in a jogging suit without shaving. I cannot afford to be disheveled ever. Because someone is always watching. I know that this is targeted to women. I know this is not targeted to any man. A man could come in without a tie one day, just like buttoned down and, you know, just like a loose collar. And you'd be like, yay, bro, you look good. Last night treat you good. You get some ass. Sorry, you get that cookie. So I I feel this is Steve having no compassion whatsoever for the people who work for him. And this is literally him doing the same thing he's doing in this book, where he's applying advice that helped make him famous, you know, dressing professionally. So a lot of, like, conservative-minded people are like, oh, look at that affable African-American gentleman. He's someone who looks respectful, who can host game shows and entertain me, right? It's it's him doing the same things that made him to be, like, a multi-billionaire, and he's like, clearly everyone needs to follow this advice. But no, it's, like, very specific to the life path that he himself has had to follow in order to have a successful media career. So um, I do kind of buy that celebrities need to appear perfect in order to avoid paparazzi catching them and making them look old or pathetic. But I did want to include this article, Naomi, about some of the worst ways Steve Harvey has dressed in the last couple of years. Because I don't even know if Steve oh, Harvey takes his own advice. Oh my god. <laughs> so I'm looking through and I'm like, okay, whatever, he can get away. This is like, you know, the jokester, like a, like the joker kind of situation in the first picture. In the second picture, mm-hmm. there's too many buttons, Okay. But the third one just got me because I was like, okay, this isn't the worst suit. And then I look at the caption and it says a color that could only be described as baby poop. And then I'm imagining you just have a baby blowout into a diaper. (laughs) So I was thinking that looks kind of like Lauren's car color. Lauren has this horrible like yellow green car and it was cheaper. I'll give her that. But like it is not attractive color. The only benefit is you can find it in a parking lot. Yeah, I don't, look, I'm not going to pretend I understand, you know, the fashion of the 1980s, 90s, and early 2000s, but, like, so many of these are ugly. They have yeah. not aged well, and they kind of look like stereotypical pimps from, like, a 1970s film. No, he has this, like, this oversized hat. One. Look at nine. Yeah, look at nine. I, yeah, I don't understand. A lot of this is oversized. It doesn't fit. I don't know if this was supposed okay. to be comedic. To his credit, to his credit, I have to give him this. It is hard to mess around with a men's suit. Like, what you see a suit, you've seen them all kind of thing. He, he, he you know, adjusts. He tries to be creative. I'm not saying it worked for him, but he tried to be creative. I wonder how this was looked at when he wore it in real time. Because looking back on it, we're like, oh, that would never do right now, like on the red carpet. I wonder what it was like when you wore it on the red carpet, though. Like, did people enjoy it? It is possible. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is... Steve has tried to give this advice that you have to always look good. He himself has 
had many bad outfits on occasion, so it's difficult yeah. to know what will look good, what will age well in a couple of years. But he's also doing this thing that really only applies to people of his caliber. People who are these, you know, multimillionaires who need to look sharp and professional in order to prevent the public from thinking, you know, they're alcoholics or addicted to drugs or whatever. It doesn't apply to someone who, like, does your makeup in the dressing room. And more than that, you know, Steve lives, we know, a very comfortable life, right? He's not having to do his laundry. Someone else does it for him. He has a maid who, you know, cleans up his bedroom. He probably is someone whose sole job is to set out the outfit every morning. He probably is someone who he can just sit down in front of and, like, read the paper or browse through, like, an iPad or something as they, like, do his hair. So, like, the idea that every single person... He doesn't person have any who, hair, Joel. What are they going to do? Just slap some moose on his bald head and call it a day? No, I, I assume the mustache, they have, like, a special ruler, and they have to make sure that every single mustache hair is perfectly cut. But you see my point, right? Like, someone making $50,000 a year as an administrative assistant to Steve Harvey in Los Angeles, this advice is meaningless. It, and it sucks that this is how he runs his business. This this feels like a sexual harassment lawsuit because he's like, you know, you used to be hotter and now you're not as hot. I was going to approach you to have an affair with, but instead I'm going to approach Sandra, who's a much hotter assistant who dresses a lot better. You it's missed your that, chance, Debbie. It's that, but it's also like the, the you can tell the difference between the boomer mindset while in the workplace versus the the Gen Z or any generation after that mindset where it's like the millennial mindset is like, we're just tired of life. And so we don't feel like getting dressed up for work every single day. And boomers are like, I don't care how tired I am. I could get three hours of sleep and still wake up and put moose on my bald head and have my chef make me a professional three course breakfast and call it a day because I make money off the your labor. You know what I mean? I, I picture Steve Harvey has like a bowling ball waxer and he just sticks his head in the top and it, you know, polishes it to a mere sheen. Every morning and every night. He every does morning. It twice a day. Yeah. But Naomi, don't worry. It's not just Steve calling out random women who read his book. It's not just Steve yeah. calling out people who work directly for him. It's also Steve calling out his current wife. Oh, no. My wife. Marjorie, who I reconnected with and married 20 years ago after we met and briefly dated, effectively put this policy into play when we first started dating again, and I always respected her for it. For the first six, five or six months of us being together, she always pulled it together, even when we were together in private. If she took a nap, she would wake up and head into the bathroom to freshen up before joining me. This sent a strong signal my way, because any woman with a guy in my position is going to be in the spotlight too. And by doing things to always be on point was just the two of us, she demonstrated to me that she could handle this role were our relationship to deepen. The same holds true for every guy, not just a celebrity whose mate's picture will be in the magazines. Every guy earning a paycheck does this because at the end of the day, he needs to have a lady on his arm who will make him feel as if he's doing well or at least better than he really is. Of course, Marjorie is a lot more relaxed now that we're married, but in our house, even several years into our marriage, she'll only go so far with the au naturel look. She'll pull her hair into a ponytail, but her skin will be glowing, and her manicure and pedicure will be fresh. And she never goes out of the house, even for the simplest errands, without looking stylish. I can't. This is a woman who is insecure that Steve is going to leave her for a fourth wife. I calls it how I sees it. <laughs> oh my god. No, but like, what makes him think that it's for him? Like, what makes him think that it's not just because, like, she wants to look that way? That's an interesting point, Naomi. I'm also thinking back to the Act Like a Lady book, where he described how, like, he got together with Marjorie after he was talking on the phone to one of his friends who was implied to be, like, a bang buddy or something and she was like how dare you i can't respect myself if i stay in this household and so he snapped his phone and was like the only reason i got together with that woman is because she showed me that she had self-respect and i'm like steve you're retconning that because you're now saying you stayed with her because she was hot right like it wasn't that she had boundaries it wasn't that she had like control over his life is because she looked good and you found her attractive Sorry, bud. Difficult to have it both ways. Wow. But it continues, Naomi. Oh, God. 
I told you in Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man that the number one reason men cheat is because there are so many women willing to cheat with them. I say to you now that what you cannot do in your house is keep providing reasons for your man to keep looking somewhere else for aesthetic stimulation. I'm sorry, but we men have to have it. It's what we like and what we want consistently. Blame yourself if your husband cheats, ladies. It was your fault for eating too many smothered pork chops, you cow. Oh my god. (laughs) I can't believe he's saying this bullshit, and people bought but this book. It's so it's so crazy because like he went for like two chapters providing like actually decent advice, and then has done this complete one eighty. And he's like, "It's not about boundaries, ladies. It's not about standing up for yourself. <laughs> it's about looking good so you can be the bang buddy of your husband. And your husband will cheat, ladies. That's a guarantee, unless you wear some lingerie around the house." I'm from the 50s. I used to work for Ford before they laid me off. This is a really good impression. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it it just sucks because, like, this is victim blaming. It's like, don't be too hot because if you're too hot in the club, then men are just going to treat you as, like, disposable. Don't be too uggo because if you're too uggo, men are going to, even if you're in a long term relationship, go and find someone who's hotter. It's it's very much like a Goldilocks thing. It's that whole Madonna whore thing. You know, you got to balance yeah. it somehow. You got to figure out exactly where your men's, man's taste is. And if you can't, well, it's your fault that he went and cheated with Becky over in HR because she was looking good because she didn't let her standards fall. This is probably what he tells his kids. This is probably what he tells his wife. He was like, oh, my exes, they let their standards slip. You shouldn't let your standards slip, my 13-year-old daughter who I've talked to exactly once. You always got to look hot for your older boyfriends. Ah! Ah! Um, cool. We got one more chapter today, Naomi. And that's titled... The Cookie. Joel, (laughs) why do we have to end like this? It's The Cookie. More on why men need it, why you should keep it. Do you want to read this or should I? Yeah, I'm going to want to read it. Okay, let's start with uh, his his reiteration about the importance of the cookie. Okay. Why was there a musical chime when I said that? Because I just got a notification. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, you know, and for the listeners, we discovered recently that if you make certain like hand signals on this app, it'll send out like heart signs or something. Uh, How do you do it? I can't do it. I can't do it. No. Go ahead, Naomi. You just have to do this. You just have to do this. And then I'm going to cut this all up. Wait. Fuck. Now I can't do it. There you go. It has to be a heart. It has to be a heart. Yeah. It has to see it. Yeah. Okay. I'll try it. Try it. Oh, break apart. Break apart. I don't know how you didn't do it. Read it. (laughs) Men absolutely cannot, I repeat, cannot live without sex or what I often refer to as the cookie. Wait, I'm confused. Is cookie sex or is cookie vagina? I don't know. I thought okay. it was vagina, but maybe I thought it was hand too. jobs would apply. Is if he he's saying breathing, don't give your... Huh. What? Because he's like... You can't even go to second breathe. base for 90 days? I don't know. If he's breathing and free and clear of medical issues, that would preclude him from getting some then a man is going to have sexual intercourse period there's nothing on this planet that makes him feel better than sex not a hole in one on the golf course not a game winning three point basket at the buzzer not even the best drug hands down it's the most gratifying tension releasing confidence building conquering feeling any one human male has could ever experience the mere release is like a pleasure valve being turned and all of that steam and built up a build up and energy rushes through, making the machine right again. And in order for our machines, our bodies, our souls, and our minds to be right, we're going to have to have sex by any means necessary. We enjoy the act that much. What about asexual men? Why did I have to Can read you this? Imagine, You're making such you a imagine Steve like dropping his manuscript for this in front of one of his secretaries and be like, Ew. I need some editing. Can you especially read chapter eight? I'd like your feedback. Ew. Uh, but also, this is so victim blamey again. He's like, men have to have sex by any means necessary. 
it's yeah. like yeah men are gonna curl up like a cockroach and die if they don't have an orgasm every couple of days it's so gross Ugh. yeah it also gives him the excuse he's like oh well my wife's not giving it to me so i gotta find it somewhere else because men need sex okay but he does have a quick follow-up if we're not in love with our partner, we don't want to cuddle. We don't want to touch. We don't want to talk and share and emote and plan and dream with you. But if we do submit to the post-coital cuddle and conversation, it's most likely insincere. Just a way for us to keep alive the possibility that if we need another sexual release in the future, you'll be available to us. What <laughs> the fuck? So it's multi-generational. It's not just this generation. It's multi-generational. <sighs> Well, he's trying to give good advice, and this is terrible advice. If men want to have a consistent source of sex, yeah, they might go through the motions and plot and scheme and pretend they actually care about this person. What's 15 minutes of cuddling in exchange for, like, multiple months of having accessible sex, right? I think he's really underestimating how much work men will go to in order to convince someone that they might have feelings for them. Yep. Um... But also, like, this is more bullshit about men not wanting to, like, be emotional or even have emotions or discuss their emotions. Like, I think a lot of men crave some form of intimacy. Um, and it might manifest in different ways, but I think that far more men than not are going to enjoy having an opportunity to spend time cuddling with their partner. <sighs> crazy. Men don't Me like crazy. Cuddling. What are you talking about? Okay, we got one more section to discuss, um, and I think you're going to have some opinions on what he says. What if I don't? If, however, you're treating sex as if it's a box of chiclets, wow, I've not thought about chiclets in a while, we'll run through Oh my god, you think he got paid for this? Like the Brinks alarm Probably. system in the last book? Yeah. Do you remember how out chiclets were in twenty in the early 2010s? Yeah, he definitely yeah. got paid. Yeah, we're an Altor generation. Yeah, true. If you have retreating sex as if it's a box of chiclets, we'll run through the relationship with you as if it's a box of chiclets. We know we you don't chew chiclets too long. You pop one in your mouth and you chew it for a little while, and then you spit it out and get another piece until the box is empty, until there's nothing left. You don't want to be the used up empty chiclets box. You want to be the one he feels emotionally connected to. Because when a man loves you and he's committed solely to you, sex means something wholly different. <laughs> wholly different. Now it becomes the pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. That ideal woman... Gotta get me had... lucky charms! <laughs> so why you weren't laughing at my dirty joke, and it was because you were so focused on hitting your joke. That ideal woman we've had in our minds since we became sexually active is now an actual person. Our ideal woman personified. And when we have sex with that woman, our physical, emotional, and mental desires synchronize and work together to get the pleasure trip that are that is exponentially better than any other sexual experience we could ever conjure up in our mind, let alone ever have had. When we're making love to a woman we love, we don't ever want it to be over we want to keep touching her and smelling her drinking her in because every inch of her rouses us in ways that no other person can drives us crazy damn near i'm just imagining steve hardy in bed right now with his wife it's kind of really gross i'm going back to the image of him dropping this in front of a secretary and being like i need notes by monday sax with that sex with that woman re sax saxophone with that woman <laughs> <laughs> rejuvenates us is this I want to have sex on. with a woman. <laughs> the comfort we need to continue. The feel good we have to have to make it through the hard times. Oh boy. Yeah, this is a lot. Though. He was doing so good. Like, there were a couple points in this book where he was like, sometimes women enjoy sex and that's totally fine. And now he's like, Christian youth counselors being like, you don't want to be a piece of used up chewing gum, do you? You don't yeah. want men to use and abuse you like chewing gum, because that's virginity, ladies. It's like a piece of chewing gum. Um, I guess my real problem with this is, like, he's painting sex as this end-all be-all for men. Where, like, men cannot live without sex, and men go in this, like, dreamlike state, this, like, euphoric high you know you might get from smoking hookah or something where you're transported into a pleasure dimension um 
And I feel I have to push back on this slightly because in my experience and mind, sex will not change your life. Um, most people, you know, who have sex for the first time don't have, you know, a series of mind blowing orgasms. Um, they have the realization that sex is fine. It's great. But, you know, it's not the end all be all of existence. Um, sex is a great experience. It's a great opportunity to bond with people. It's a great opportunity to like relieve stress. But, and I, I mean this in all sincerity, Naomi, so is garlic bread. So is watching sports on TV. What? So is like watching someone you mentor to achieve great heights. Orgasms are wonderful, but many people achieve great orgasms by themselves and ha- find them f- harder to do with partners. That's not to say some people don't have like eye rolling seizures during sex with partners or fantasize nonstop stop about sex all the time. But for most people, that just isn't the case. Sex is an activity that has a lot of like cultural and social expectations bound up in it. So it's often treated as more important and worthy of consideration than it needs to be. But it's not going to be what he's describing for the vast majority of people, including men. And so I find it crazy that he's describing sex as this and being like, ladies, this is what you should expect from your men. When it's like, maybe this might be true for some subset of people, but I genuinely don't think like men are these sex crazed wolves chasing after women. I think they may think they need to act that way, but I don't think that's how they genuinely like act deep down. I don't think that's how, you know, they, they, they think about it. Um, they probably, you know, want to increase their scorecard. They probably want to have, you know, a story to tell their friends. They probably want to try to impress a woman without knowing where the clit is. But like, they're 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 not in this like obsessive dream state, chasing sex at every waking moment. That's just not how people think. Are you with me on that? Garlic bread, Naomi. I don't know. I love garlic bread. I would say that it definitely isn't like this every single time, but I do think that you do have a good connection with people that you, uh, I'm a big believer in like the fact that you have a better connection with people that you're emotionally invested in rather than people that you're just randomly having sex with. And that's why I feel like a lot of people have a lot of bad sex is because like, yeah, you can have that one, you know, exception to the rule, which is like someone that you're just hooking up with, but you have like really great sex with, but it, goes to a whole different level when you're actually emotionally invested with that person. So I wouldn't go to extreme lengths and talk about myself, you know, smelling her and drinking her in and every inch of her arouses us in ways Mm. that no other person can. But I would say like, yeah, it's great. And then move on because I'm not Steve Harvey talking like just, it just me imagining him just being like, "Mm," dragging his finger up his wife's back. It's just like, I bet he like rubs the mustache back and forth like a push broom. (laughs) Ew! Stop! Stop! I thought mine was bad! Okay, so he finishes up the chapter. We're not going to read anymore. I'll just summarize it. He goes on and is like, well, ladies, not having sex on occasion won't drive your man out of the house. But then he immediately caveats that and says it's more fun to cheat with someone who isn't nagging you about chores and paying bills. Um... So he also then tries to say women should be able to expect their men don't cheat, but then follows that by saying, well, you kind of ask for it when you don't wear lingerie to bed. Um, So whole mixed bag of like whether or not men are these horny animals you can't expect to be like faithful to you. He kind of just implies like, well, it's going to happen if you don't stay hot. Um, and that's where the advice I mentioned earlier comes in. Cause he's like, Hey, here's some advice for how to get your man to be better in bed. Um, which is weird because I thought he said men couldn't change, but here he is giving advice for changing a man. Um, I don't know. It's not consistent in that regard either, but he's like, don't attack him and be like, you suck. You got to make concessions and be like, if you light some candles, I'll wear more lingerie in bed. It's got to be a team effort, baby. Um, And okay, I agree with the assessment that, like, if you want to talk about your partner's sexual performance, you don't turn it into a fight. But also, not the best advice, Steve. Um, I, again, I think Steve not doesn't even think that, that women have any any parts down there that experience pleasure, um, because he doesn't bring up the concept of teaching a man how to satisfy you orally um which you'd think would be relevant but again it's probably not something he's ever done so it's not something he can speak intelligently about um he then says he's like hey here's some advice for like 
how to structure these conversations. He's like, when I want to have conversations like this, I always go to the beach or to the lake. I find it so peaceful out there sitting on the beach or lake with my significant other talking about our sex life. And I'm picturing like three times a week him driving Marjorie out to a bench like on the beach and being like, listen, lady, we got some problems here. Oh, or alternatively, Marjorie my could God. do it. Yeah, Marjorie just takes him to the beach. Hey, so um, we still haven't made me come yet. It's been 20 years. Uh, can we get on that? <laughs> I have been so sexy for you, Steve. I have dressed so well for you, Steve. Why don't you notice how well I dress he's for like, you? He's like, I like the candles and you wear the lingerie. What's missing? And she's like, I haven't fucking come in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> but but Naomi, his, 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 his end-all be-all advice is, after you've had a conversation with your partner about improving the sex life and the concessions you both will make in order to improve the sex life, you got to go practice then and now you got to go to the backseat of a car. You got to go to your mother's, uh, 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 your mother's washing machine room. You got to find a safe space. And and I'm not joking. Let me pull up the actual section. I don't want to misquote this man, but he definitely says something about that. Oh my God. He's like, the only place I can get aroused is my mother's house. <laughs> That's so Freudian. That is so Freud. Freudian with, Freud would have a freaking heyday about that. Immediately put your promises into action. I mean, head right into the bedroom, the backseat of your car, your mother's laundry room, and do what the two of you said you were going to do. Nothing solidifies the conversation better than that, and you're guaranteed to get exactly what you're looking for. Anyways, I think that's where we're going to leave off this week. I've sufficiently horrified Naomi. Naomi can only take one dose of Steve a week. Um... I don't blame her. It's pretty gross having to read this and then filter it down because he has like 15 terrible things a chapter and I have to condense it to like three and really get the highlights out. Um, it's a tough job. Someone's got to do it. Next cha- next time, Naomi, and next time might be the last time. We'll see. Uh, we might be able to finish the book next time. We open with chapter nine and chapter nine is just called The N-Word. <laughs> And that's where we leave you, ladies and gentlemen. We love you so much. Uh, just so everyone knows, we do have a Patreon. We understand that the economy sucks right now, so we're not asking for your money if you can't give it to us. But if you would love us enough, um, please go like and leave us a review on any of our um, streaming platforms. Um, it's a really great way to give us a little Christmas present. Um, we love you very much. Have a great week. <laughs>